Hello, this is Jamie Rosenfield, Senior Vice President of IHS Market and Co-Chair of Sewer Week. We have a very special Voice of Innovation today, um, a conversation between Walter Isaacson, author and professor at Tulane University, and Susan Hockfield, President Emerita of MIT, and author of The Age of Living Machines, How Biology Will Build the Next Technology Revolution. Susan and Walter will discuss the future of science and technology, the coming revolution in biology, the pandemic, the future of the innovation ecosystem, and the implications for energy and the environment. Thank you for joining us for this fascinating dialogue presented by IHS Market. Susan, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, it's a thrill to be here with you, Walter. Your book, which I totally adore, The Age of Living Machines, turned out to be so prescient for this moment. Uh, why did you end up writing it? Well, you know, I discovered this convergence of biology with engineering as a major theme almost as soon as I was appointed as MIT's president. I had a few months to get up to speed, and I took those months to talk to everyone I possibly could to learn what I could about MIT. And I had a pivotal conversation with the then dean of engineering, Tom Magnanti, uh, where um, in that conversation, first of all, he reminded me that MIT School of Engineering is the largest and the most important. And I took that on. I said, yes, of course, I understand that, Dean. It but means that you work for him is what he was trying to uh, say. Well, you know, um, the president does work for the faculty, <laughs> of course. Mm. Um, but then he went on to tell me something truly amazing. He told me that of the almost 400 faculty members in the School of Engineering, a third of them were using biological parts in their work. And I was well aware of biomedical engineering, so I offered that as my understanding. And he shook his head and said, well, you know, that's only the smallest part of it. And from then on, I just discovered uh, so many new technologies emerging from the convergence of biology with engineering and the hard sciences. It's an exciting story, and I think it is going to be the technology story of the 21st century. And right. You know, during, during the past 50 years, when you, know, you and I were coming of age, it was a digital technology that drove things, and we became part of a digital revolution. But what you're saying in this book is that it's going to be the connection of engineering to biology that's going to create a new life science engineering revolution. Absolutely. And Walter, one of the things, much as I you know, love all of my computer devices, and hadn't really paused to think about where it came from. I mean, you and I know who the great innovators were that, and are that have produced these digital marvels. But as I thought about it, I realized that what enabled the electronics and the information and the computer industries was a convergence of physics with engineering. So the parts list of physics really wasn't known until around 1900. Thomson discovered the electron in 1897, and the components of the atom were, were resolved. And, you know, engineers love a parts list. And so they picked up those parts and turned them into the electronic gadgets that we have so enjoyed. And frankly, the electronics, computer, and information industries in my view, and I think everyone would agree that have been the most transformational technologies and industries of the 20th century. And, and what uh, are the parts lists that uh, comprise what you're calling the next phase, which is a biological parts list? Well, you know, biology didn't have a parts list at the beginning, first half of the 20th century. A very important science as a biologist, I will assert that it has been an important science for centuries. But it was only with the advent of molecular biology and genomics that we really had a parts list of biology that, of course, the engineers were picking up, as the dean told me, to turn into technologies that really sound like science fiction, but they're not. And um, it's an understanding that is not general yet, but I think it's a, an exciting promise for solving the great challenges that are with us in the 21st century. Well, when you talk about the molecular parts list for biology, I assume you're talking about two really great molecules, DNA and RNA. Is that right? DNA, RNA, and I throw proteins in there too, because uh, the DNA and RNA by themselves mm -hmm. rarely manifest function. 
So the DNA and the RNA that produce these fantastic little machines called proteins, you know, really represent a parts list that allow engineers to build incredible new kinds of technology with a kind of resolution. You know, these biological parts are very, very small. Hmm. And it allows engineers to build from very small components really extraordinary new kinds of technologies. Give me a couple of examples. Okay, so one of my favorites is um, for water. You know, we've been purifying water for thousands of years. I think there's a, an engraving in an Egyptian tomb from, I don't know, 1500 BC or something, showing um, uh, distillation. So we've been distilling dirty water to provide clean water for thousands of years or filtering it through sand or now through complex chemically built filters. And yet today we don't have anywhere near enough clean water to meet the world's needs. It's a hard problem, but um, you know, our cells, the cells in every organism on earth have figured out how to purify water. If you think about the way your skin feels, it has this lovely texture because the cells in our skin are very clever at regulating the amount of water. And, you know, if you sit in a hot bath too long, you come out and your, your, your fingertips are all puckered up because, you know, we have uh, confused, let's just say, our water system that regulates the water that goes in and out of our cells. It ends up that um, that water control in cells is mediated by a protein, a very, very small channel that regulates the flow of water into and out of a cell. It was discovered by a hematologist named Peter Agri at Johns Hopkins University. And um, he did an incredible set of studies on this protein that he named, beautiful name, aquaporin, hmm. or water pore. And every organism uses this water pore. And as he was doing the basic science around this, there was a biophysicist entrepreneur who was following the work. And he said to himself, huh, if our cells use this magnificent protein to purify water, could we use that protein to purify water for our use? He founded a company called Aquapore NAS, it's located outside of Copenhagen, that's building water filters mm -hmm. using the aquaporin protein. And he said something, when as I was writing the book, I went to visit him and he said something that just captured the whole concept for me. He said, you know, I could bust my brain trying to invent a new way to purify water but why don't I just use nature's genius to do it for us? Can you give me an example of how we might use nature's genius in that way, adapt something from nature that might help us in the energy in, in, industry, especially with batteries, storage, whatever it may be? Yeah, this became another just passion of mine while I was president of MIT. Obviously we face an incredible energy challenge. Our energy uh, use right now is unsustainable and we've got to get to a, better energy future, a more sustainable energy future. And while, you know, I like wind and I like solar, the rate limiting technology for these intermittent energy sources, the sun doesn't always shine, the wind doesn't always blow. And the rate limiting technology is actually energy storage, which we call batteries. And we have gotten better and better at batteries, but still state of the art lithium ion batteries aren't going to be the sustainable solution that we need to really scale up energy to the level we need. Lithium is rare, cobalt is rare, and frankly, the manufacturing processes for batteries are pretty unsustainable in themselves. They're done at very high temperature, that is a big energy input, and there are a lot of toxic byproducts. A colleague of mine at MIT uh, was fascinated in biological organisms and how they do their work without contaminating their world. And she thought, her name is Angela Belcher, and she thought, well, you know, for example, if the abalone can build its shell and then have that shell disintegrate when the abalone dies without contaminating the ocean in which it lives, why can't we? And she's persuaded viruses, benign lab strains of viruses, to assemble the components of batteries the batteries that her viruses build are built at room temperature without any toxic byproducts. And the batteries have the same charge density, that is they can hold the same amount of electricity as a state-of-the-art lithium ion battery. 
and can cycle through charge and discharge cycles, the same as, again, state-of-the-art lithium-ion batteries. But if we could use nature to build our batteries, we would be far better off. And this could get us to a much better energy future. Um, now, I used lithium-ion as an example, but uh, she's way out ahead of all of us because I came back from one of the talks I gave with a question about these batteries. And she looked at me with kind of horror and she said, oh, we're not using lithium anymore. <laughs> so she has her viruses now assembling batteries out of earth abundant materials that again, have the same storage capacity as state of the art lithium ion batteries. So again, if we could use nature's genius to build the storage energy storage capacity we need we'd be getting out ahead of our current uh, dilemma of not really having a sustainable uh, uh, solution for our energy challenges. That reminds me of something that uh, I'm writing about, which is Jennifer Doudna, Fong Zhang, and others who adapted the immune system that bacteria have to fight off viruses, which is known as CRISPR, and just saying, how can we adapt that both to edit our own genes, but now to fight off the coronavirus, to do it just the way bacteria does, which is remember the uh, genetic sequences of a virus, and then guide an enzyme to cut that genetic sequence when the virus comes again. How do you think the coronavirus pandemic that we're in right now might further these ideas you've been talking about? Yeah, I think, you know, in crises, we often see the lacunae in our understanding and, you know, really the gaps in our systems. And for me, the thing that uh, continues to haunt me about our response to the coronavirus is what I call a diagnostics deficit. So this nation has not turned its mind toward the importance of diagnostics. So for the coronavirus, we're seeing it writ large. Even today, in my view, we don't have sufficiently accurate, sufficiently rapid, sufficiently cheap diagnostics. The countries that have managed to control the coronavirus are countries that have been able to track and trace. Well, to track, you need to diagnose at a level that we aren't even beginning to approach here in the United States. And um, one of the technologies that I profile in the book is a uh, new way to diagnose disease. And you know, this whole business of diagnostics, you don't need it just in a pandemic. If we think about our healthcare system in the United States, we spend 18% of GDP roughly on healthcare. And uh, that looks like it's gonna grow. And while we have some breathtaking new approaches to, to treat disease, I can use cancer as an example, I mean, miraculous new ways to control cancer. Not all cancers, but some cancers. But truth be told, we're diagnosing cancer really late in the game. And it's pretty darn expensive and really hard to pull people back from that cliff of dying from cancer again, once they've already reached the edge of the cliff. It's much easier if you can diagnose cancer earlier, much earlier, be a lot easier to control it but you need some, uh, a diagnostic with greater sensitivity. So um, Sangeeta Bhatia, who's an MD, PhD, has again <laughs> used the genius of biology to develop a much more sensitive diagnostic. And she's a nanotechnologist, so she, she starts out with nanoparticles. I mean, this combination, again, of engineering and biology and decorates these nanoparticles with a little bit of a protein that cancer cells uniquely cut. So these cancer, this cancer protein is called an enzyme that cuts proteins. And why do cancer cells do that? Well, cancer cells misbehave. Mm -hmm. Your liver cells stay where they're supposed to be. But liver cells in the cancer are crazy. They move all around. They move places they shouldn't be. When cancer gets sufficiently advanced, they even leave the liver and go someplace else and create damage there. But what Sankita figured out is if she could detect not the cells themselves, but something that amplifies, she could find a cancer potentially earlier. And she uses, again, these uh, cancer enzymes as the detector and enzymes do their job over and over and over again. So it's not just one cell, one product, it's 
one cell, lots of enzymes, lots of product. So she, she injects these nanoparticles into a mouse, now in clinical trials in a human. Mm -hmm. And um, the nanoparticles have this little protein that the cancer enzyme cuts. And, um, you know, if you don't have cancer, nothing happens to the nanoparticle. You don't see it. But if you do, the enzyme clips off these little proteins and the protein remainder, that little uh, cut off bit, finds its way into the urine. And so this is a urine-based diagnostic test for cancer that can detect cancers that are about the tenth the size of current state-of-the-art detection techniques and really offer the possibility of being able to cure more people than we can cure today by detecting cancer earlier. Anyway, and you know, yeah. people ask me about urine-based diagnostics and how realistic that is. And um, you know, for people of a certain age, uh, not my age and not your age, probably, mm -hmm. you know, I don't really think about it that often, but the over-the-counter pregnancy test is urine-based, it's cheap, it's accurate. And you could wish that we had a diagnostic test like that for the coronavirus right now. We will have a test for the coronavirus like that in a few months, I suspect, because Feng Zhang at your institution of MIT and Jennifer Doudna at Berkeley are creating these saliva uh, sort of pregnancy at home tests where you just use a test strip to see uh, whether you have any particular virus or for that matter, cancer. And these are going to be at home tests. It'll be a while before we get them at home. But to me, and I want to ask you this as a question, it's almost like those days in the 1970s when suddenly we could bring computers home and then eventually cell phones and it became part of our personal lives. It seems to me one thing that's going to happen is when these diagnostic tests come into our home, we will have biology woven into our lives the way we now have digital technology, cell phones and you know microwaves even woven into our lives. I agree. And it is um, getting biology essentially out of the lab into our hands and making it easy. I mean, a urine-based diagnostic test, a saliva-based diagnostic test, I don't want to have to go to the doctor every time I have a scratchy throat to know if I've got strep. I'd like to just figure it out at home. Mm -hmm. Why not? One of the other really um, accelerations of transformation that has happened that will partner with these kinds of tests is... Um, video medicine, teleconferencing. I mean, um, I've watched my colleagues in the medical sphere here in Boston, some of the best academic medical centers in the country, struggling to figure out how to do telemedicine. Well, guess what? The coronavirus made it happen. And so there will be a number of things like this uh, CRISPR-based diagnostic test uh, that will continue and have a huge impact you know, Walter, you and I have talked about this before, and um, I, I think you and I are uh, people who love to think about collaboration and communities of work, because while we always like to imagine that there's a lone inventor, truth be told, yeah. that lone inventor doesn't have the impact that she or he would have unless they connect to a community that uh, helps bring a great idea into being. And uh, one of the things that has pleased me enormously is in the face of this pandemic, across the Boston region, people have come together to find these solutions in ways that I had only dreamed of. I'd worked pretty hard and always felt like pushing a rock up a hill to uh, increase the um, kind of collaborations across institutions between the academy and industry, you know, to accelerate uh, progress people bring different parts of the solution together so you can get something done. And I very much hope that it's not just technologies like CRISPR-based diagnostics and telemedicine that will continue, but also this new way of working together, I hope will uh, yeah. continue after, after we're, let's hope there's an after. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and I do think you're right that the collaboration and sharing and openness that have come from the coronavirus crisis will serve as a counterweight to the past 20 or 30 years when intellectual property and patents and lawyering, you know, finding lawyers to document every little discovery and make it proprietary, that became more and more dominant. I think we have to get a balance between the desire to patent things and the desire to collaborate and to share. 
Um, let me move back a little bit to energy because you've written some about carbon capture and sequestration too. And I was wondering where you think that's going to be headed. Yeah, so these have been um, the idea of using biology in the energy domain holds enormous promise. Uh, the most obvious one is biofuels, and boy, well, that has proved to be much harder <laughs> than we ever imagined. Part of it is because nature is very conservative. Nature likes doing things the way she does them, and you can persuade some bacterium, some organism, to make a biofuel that it doesn't normally make. But um, guess what? When given a chance to run free, it reverts back to its normal form. So biofuels, I think, are still promising, but they're out there a bit. One of the approaches that... Um, uh, I think is very promising is that we think of the fossil fuel problem in terms of usually what we put into our cars and trucks and airplanes, but there's another really big problem in that um, fossil fuels are, are the feedstock for many of the materials that we enjoy today. And there's a lot of really important work on figuring out how to organically generate those feedstocks and not go having to go back to oil and gas to actually produce the plastics that we need. And as soon as I say plastics, people think, eek, why don't we, you know, we don't need more plastics. However, we do need plastics. And on the other side of it, we also need to be able to get rid of the plastics. And so that's also, I think, a very promising direction where people are designing um, new ways to um, break down plastics, again, using microorganisms that are all around us. Your CRISPR description, I think is, um, you know, one of the most delightful one of the most delightful discoveries in recent times, because who knew that bacteria were smart enough to figure out, you know, who the invaders might be and repel them the next time through mechanisms that we can now harness. And so yeah, well, you, you got to give them a lot of credit, but they did have 3 billion years to figure it out. We have about <laughs> three months to figure it out. So we're going to have to be even cleverer. Yeah. Right. So um, is that also for, um, uh, um, I know of a number of projects on carbon capture. You know, we think, oh, this would be great if we could pull CO2 out of, out of the air or out of a, uh, you know, a smokestack. Um, it's a very hard problem. Uh, the uh, kinetics of CO2 capture and, um, and, you know, and conversion are pretty, pretty, are pretty tricky. But people are, I think, making a lot of great progress using, again, bioorganisms to do the hard work that has to be done, of course, at a very small scale. But that's what bioorganisms are good at. So I think there's a lot of promise. Um, but like um, everything else, uh, that promise takes a lot of work, takes a lot of financial support, and um, takes a, an innovation system that actually is set up to accelerate the hard tech that is make, making physical things change. That's a, that's a tough problem. One of the that's advantages of the computer tech. revolution is it's fast. I mean, you can write new code, um, you know, every five minutes if you need to. And, um, and just the biology, you know, physical reality so far moves on a much slower pace than uh, computer technology. Yeah, it's interesting that our digital tech, we've got an amazing amount of things in the past 50 years. The uh, progress has been exponential, and yet in the physical world, whether it be batteries or airplane travel or whatever, our progress has been uh, pretty minimal. So it will be interesting to see if in this next phase that you talk about, we can uh, make progress in the physical space the way we have in the digital space. And that ties into something you've written about that's almost an umbrella for this discussion we've had, which is Malthus, the Malthusian <laughs> dilemma. How are we going to defeat it? Yeah, so, um, you know, uh, the Reverend Thomas Robert Malthus in 1798 wrote a treatise on the principle of population, and he made this observation. He was a great demographer, and we kind of make fun of him now, but he was a great demographer. And he documented the fact that in Britain in 1798, late uh, 18th century, population growth that rate was faster than the rate of growth in agricultural productivity. Not a happy scene. Mm -hmm. Many more people than the amount of food will support. And he went back and did a study and said, wow, this happens again and again through history. Every time it happens, it self-corrects in a very unpleasant way. Mm -hmm. So when population grows faster than agricultural productivity, you end up with wars and famine and pestilence. 
uh, and these external factors that reduce the population back down to a level that the resources can support. 1790, he sounded the warning call. It was gonna happen again. One of the things he didn't know was that there was new technology that was about to accelerate food production in Britain and Western Europe. And those technologies, there were several, but the main ones were uh, four field crop rotation. And every time you have put, go from three field to four field crop rotation, you can produce more food. But more impactfully, there had become a vibrant trade in, I will politely call it fertilizer. It really was bird guano, bird poop that had been discovered by those seafaring adventurers who were going around the world. You know, when I read about them when I was in fourth grade, very exciting. They were looking for jewels and gold and tobacco and all kinds of exotic things. And they found those, but they also found piles and piles of bird guano, spectacular fertilizer, brought back to England and Western Europe and food product, uh, productivity uh, rocketed. Population, of course, keeps up with the uh, availability of food. And my thesis is that we are right now in another Malthusian dilemma. We've got somewhere in the neighborhood of 7.2, 7.5 billion people on the planet. And the best prognosticators tell us that we're gonna have close to 10 billion by around 2050. And already, as we've just talked about, we're not doing so great on healthcare. We're not doing so great on water. We're not doing so great on food. We're not doing so great on energy. How are we gonna meet the needs of 10 billion people without, again, falling into the Malthusian uh, dilemma. And my answer to that is, you know, in the past, when we've been smart and lucky, we've innovated our way out. And I think we can do it again. And it's one of the reasons why I wrote the book, which is that um, there are not many ways that non-scientists, non-engineers can understand the promise of the technologies as they're arising. And it's a way of sharing the, my optimism and my hope that we will once again be able to innovate our way out of today's Malthusian dilemma. But to do that requires um, a lot of input. It requires really sound policy. Uh, it requires people being committed to inventing a future that's better than the present. And my fear, Walter, um, and you know this history far better than I, is that great bursts of technology progress, progress are usually catalyzed by war. The World War II is a shining example of the kind of technology development that can happen over a very short period under the pressure of an existential threat. And um, I end the book by saying that I hope that our next episode of technological innovation can be driven by not the threat of war, but the promise of peace. Because these existential threats today are not just theoretical threats, they are threats that will, in a Malthusian prediction, result in war and pestilence and famine if we don't figure out how to innovate our way out of it. Well, in some ways, we're having a war in the wars with the coronavirus, and it will create a biological revolution, just as the wars of the past created ones in physical and uh, uh, electronic revolution. Uh, and finally, if I may ask, you're such an expert on manufacturing. How is this all going to affect U.S. manufacturing in the future? Well, this is one of the great promises that I see, Walter, when we talk about reviving U.S. manufacturing, people often think about going back to the manufacturing modalities of the past, and that's not going to be a winning solution. So the manufacturing modalities of the future is a place that the United States can and should play. We've gotten started with a number of manufacturing hubs. I think there are 14 that were started out of a uh, a group I co-chaired, the Advanced Manufacturing Partnership, I co-chaired with Andrew Liveris uh, under President Obama, and it recommended that we start up manufacturing hubs to get started, to bring together, again, the academy, uh, industry, finance, to figure out how to use our nation's strengths to innovate a new manufacturing revolution. And I think that the kinds of things we've been talking about today could well be deployed to the manufacturing revolution of the future that 
can be done in a very different way from the manufacturing of the past. And uh, once again, is the promise for uh, not just betterment of lives in the United States, but around the world. So I think it could have a big impact on manufacturing. There is a bill making steady progress called the Endless Frontiers Act um, that uh, has two components. One component is setting up the National Science Foundation as a, the place with the responsibility to actually accelerate this, accelerate the science and the engineering, but also accelerate the translation into products for the marketplace along with that funding for the National Science Foundation for the projects themselves is uh, funding for additional manufacturing hubs to drive these technologies as rapidly as possible into the uh, manufacturing uh, powers uh, for the 21st century. The Endless Frontiers Act, as you know, you know, we yeah. historians love the roots of that the uh, Science, the Endless Frontier was the name of the essay that Vannevar Bush wrote for President uh, Roosevelt right before he died. And that starts the National Science Foundation. And science being the endless frontier, he said it meant we had to invest in basic research so we could get to the innovations that you've just been talking about. And it seems that's where we are now. Yes. It was, it's a, a, one of the most breathtaking pieces of scientific thought, uh, political statement. You know, it was the blueprint for the second half of the 20th century and how an individual could have that kind of foresight. And actually, um, at the heart of it was that we've expended more money than we ever could have dreamed that we would have had to win World War II. And rather than pulling back, we should double down and do it again to invent the second half of the 20th century, which indeed we did, thanks to Bush. Yeah. And you know what else, Walter? I mean, everyone assumes that what we know is everything that needs to be known. And CRISPR illustrates that, boy, there is so much more to discover that we can put to, uh, so, to good use. Uh, and so that fundamental research is really... We will never be able to innovate our way ahead if we don't start by making sure that our advances in basic science uh, keep up. And people sometimes try to blur the distinction, and the distinction can be blurred, but you would not have had the transistor or the microchip had you not had people trying to figure out surface state physics and how quantum theory works on the surface states of semiconducting materials for years. I mean, these are people who weren't thinking, and if we figure this out, we'll have a transistor. But likewise, you had these weird biologists who were finding bacteria in salt ponds in Spain and in Yellowstone Park that had these re repeated sequences they couldn't figure out. They never said, oh, someday that will be a tool in which we can edit our genes and fight coronavirus. They were just doing it out of basic science. Exactly, so my, my, my long talk starts with Faraday and J.J. Thompson, and I remind people, they were not doing it so that I could have a cell phone. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> you know, when you ask how could Vannevar Bush had such foresight, I'll just bring it back to where we started this conversation. He was Dean of Engineering at MIT, <laughs> well, of course. Susan, of course. thank you so very much for joining us. Walter, it's a great joy to speak with you. Thank you so much.